And please say your name and say one <laughs> sentence. Uh, and say one sentence. What are you working on? Uh, No, I'm just looking for my uh, notebook. If I lost it today, it would be disaster. Especially if you will find it, it would be a bit uh, If you find my notebook, don't know if you know it. Um, that it contains diet and um, Anyway. <laughs> Thank you very much. Thank you. Okay, can we go please around the room and um, say your name and say in one sentence what are you working on and if you're not working on anything, just make it up. I'm Simona and I'm preparing to give birth. So <laughs> get one. To get worse? <laughs> 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 um, to give birth to what? To work. Yeah. Good. Do, would you like to tell us a little bit more about it? Uh, no. Okay. Alessandro, I'm working on sets. On sets. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much. Buttons? Yeah. You mean like uh, buttons? Okay, good. My name is Hilary. Um, I am working on um, the disintegration of the human being. The disintegration? Of the human being. Of the human being. <laughs> good luck. I am I tried to create an image uh, with a noise. An image? With a noise. With a noise? Yeah. Interesting, good. Thank you very much. Hi, my name is Vinicius and I am working on comparisons between digital color and color and painting. Thank you. Would you like to tell us what happened to your hand? I fell off my bicycle. Oh. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Hi, my name is Aria. I'm working on touching between photography, film and uh, 3D printing via body. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Ben, and I'm working on understanding uh, second level of self-awareness. Second level? Of self-awareness. Of self-awareness. Yeah. Great. Hey, I'm Alex. I've been working on video plays. Thank you. Hi, I'm Esther. I'm working um, on photography without a camera. Nice. I'm Ben, and I'm working to move my work away from being projected. From being projected. Projected. Good. I am Michelle. I don't know what I'm working on, so I'm reading a lot. I'm not really working on anything at the moment. Say it again. I'm reading a lot. I'm not working on anything at the moment. And what are you reading? They're losing the time. Good. Let's go. Let's go. But let's go. I'm working on the mirror stage. Mirror stage? So you're reading Lacan? Yeah. Oh. <laughs> Welcome, Lacanian. Hi, <laughs> um, well, I'm, uh, I'm trying to start working on something. I didn't hear, sorry, it's so not noisy. Um, I'm working on to start working on Did you hear? Ah, okay, okay, thanks. I know I'm Marx, I try to learn how to play. Thank you. Um, I'm Natalia, I'm uh, working in my feeling of being lost all the time. Okay, thank you very much. I'm Valentina, and I don't know if I should keep working with a project of mobile. When I say I don't hear you, it's not because I'm deaf, it's because this thing is next to my ear and it makes a lot of noise. So 
it's on my, it's my little love. Um, I don't know if keep working on my password or move on. Great, thank you. Hi, my name is Sasha and I'm now writing a play about this philosophy. Thank you, Sasha. Hi, my name is Elisa and I'm working on my skirt. Thanks. Um, I'm Marian. I don't know what I'm working on. I'm trying to sort, you know, to decide what I'm going to do next. Thank you. Hi, my name is Lucrezia, and I'm working on drawing and animation, but without using any software. Okay. <laughs> Hi, my name is Timo, and I'm trying to teach myself the basics of uh, Java. Cool. What do you want to do there? I don't know. <laughs> Do you learn it from uh, Linda.com? Um, not yet. I'm on the website that um, I'm going to Okay. 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 Thanks. Okay. 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 My name is Rupert. Mm -hmm. I'm working on objects and what they embody. My name is Matilde and I'm working on perceptions. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Matilde. I'm Cecilia and I'm trying to tie in my different mm -hmm. stories that I've written together. Uh, I'm Wes and I'm interested in the speculation we construct around objects. Okay. <laughs> yeah, good. Um, okay, great. So, let's see where we got last week and how we can uh, move on. So, last week, I thought we had a really, really lovely, um, lively and lovely discussion um, about this sort of break that happens in the end of the classical period and the beginning of the modern period, and how this break between the classical and the modern is articulated in the painting. And we specifically looked at Velasquez's famous painting Las Meninas and compared it to a landscape by, Ver by Vermeer, uh, this, uh, this very lovely uh, um, cityscape of the city of Delhi. And we were trying to explore what is the difference in these two paintings in the way they treat representation. So I thought that was, to me at least, it was very interesting and I feel that I really, um, with your help, understood things in, a, in perhaps in a more um, in a clearer way than I did until that point. So, uh, so I, I, for me it was a very interesting session. And also I just wanted to say that um, after the session Sasha came to me and said, well it looks that artists are really much uh, smarter than philosophers because Velasquez figured it out 300 years before Foucault. <laughs> and uh, at that point, I didn't have much to say as often as it often happens. <laughs> uh, you know, um, the reply comes to you when it is too late. But I can use my privilege as a teacher and, and bring it back still. And the point I think is that it is of course true, but at the same time, it took a philosopher to see that in Velasquez. Yeah. Uh, so. And I think, it is, it, I, I think it's very interesting to look at paintings as philosophy and look at philosophy as art. And in a sense, that's really what we are doing. We want to also look at your work as philosophical, as experiments, both in art and in philosophy, both uh, objects of research and aesthetic objects of visual pleasure or sensual pleasure. Uh, OK. so. With that in mind, today we are turning to um, this. <coughs> Deleuze and Guattari, thousands of those. So, it's a headstone. Yeah. Um, I have it for maybe 15 years now. Um, I don't think I still, I don't think I finished reading it. There are parts here that I read many, many times. There are parts that I didn't read and maybe never will. Uh, I think the part that I read most of all is the index. Because you can, because, yeah, because I think it, it is a kind of book that 
you can just go through the index and come across something that you that you feel is interesting, that may be Bach, or becoming an abstract machine, or binary relations, or uh, borderline, and go to the place in the book where it is being discussed and see if you can work with that. This is, to me, the way to read this book, you know, by starting from the index. Having said that, the introduction, the first chapter, then, which is also the introduction, on the reason, or the reason. I'm not sure how is it supposed to say in English, reason or reason? Reason. Yeah? Okay. Um, so, reason, reason. Uh, we are um, going to read today. Um, and uh, the next two weeks, we will spend on two other chapters from this book, which I think are sort of interesting and relevant. But there are many other topics that you might find very useful when you work on your research paper, when you work on your practice. So the next three weeks, at least, we're going to spend with this book. I want you to get to know it um, a little bit in, in the same way that we got to know last semester um, and Oedipus. And this book is, to some extent, a continuation, to some extent, a very different project, but both belong to this um, project by Deleuze and Guattari that is called uh, Capitalism and Schizophrenia. Um, now, I also want to say that um, it is not very often, or perhaps even rare, that this book is read in uh, photography courses. Yeah? I, to be honest, I don't know of any photography course where this book is looked at as, as kind of photography manual or as a as a key compendium, compendium of thinking about the photographic image. But it is for me that kind of book. And I think it is indispensable if you want to make art in the digital and the network age. Um, I hope that as we work with it, with, through some of the text, you might see why that is. Um, but at the same time, this is a book that is quite often read on fine art courses. Yeah. So here you have a kind of um, interesting difference or um, I don't to think about. Um, you know, for what reason um, photography never really found itself very comfortable with what the lesson and what I have to say. And I want to start with just this question. Uh, so first um, first let me find Text on, uh, <coughs> okay. Uh, Let's first have a look at the introduction by Brian Masumi. Uh, Masumi is himself a very interesting philosopher. He translated Antiochus to English. Um, I think he's uh, working in Canada. Um, and his introduction, his, sorry, the translator's forward is I think it's very short, it's kind of quite to the point. Um, before we move to the very essence of the question here, let's have a look at what he has to say <coughs> about the two people behind the book, Gilles Deleuze and Félix Guattari. So let's read about Deleuze first. It just starts on page on page 9 in Roman numerals and then moves on to uh, yeah, let's start there uh, anyone feels like um, reading now? you will read, thank you very much to start from this line and then I will scroll uh, Gilles Deleuze was called in that philosophy that's the line? yes okay. uh, Gilles Deleuze was called in that philosophy the titles of his earliest books read like a week's book on philosophical journeys. What got me by during that period was conceiving of the history of philosophy as a kind of aspect or what amounts to the same thing as immaculate conception. I imagine myself approaching an author from behind and giving him a child that would indeed be his, but would nonetheless be monstrous. 
monstrous. You can stop here. This is, in essence, a method. Uh, this is... Make it bigger. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Good. Thank you. Uh, this is... What does it mean? I mean, he said here... Okay. Uh, can you read us again? reading, or making art, or making work, yeah? It, is, it basically says... Oh my god. Okay. I don't know. Is there, did something happen that we need to attend? Sorry, I passed, but I just broke. Okay. Uh, do we have glass on the floor? It's not, sorry. Alright, no, 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 no need to apologize, but... Is there glass on the floor? Alex, you have a room. Yeah. Uh, do we need to stop the session? Or we can leave it for afterwards. Yeah. Okay. It's not better. Is it possible to the same move it to the with, with your foot kind of to push it to the side of the wall so it doesn't get uh, that people don't get hurt? I'll just make sure that I stay here. So okay. <laughs> okay. In, in the break we'll clean. All right. Uh, so I just wanted to say this is. This is a method. So the learner here in this short quotation describes how he read the classical texts. He said, I read them. What does it mean to conceive of the history of philosophy as a kind of asphalt? Well, first, it immediately shows you that here is a particular kind of philosophical discourse that builds a vocabulary not around the classical philosophical terms, yeah? which is already quite interesting. Um, but what is important here is that the method is to approach a classical text in order to extract from it something that is there, but is kind of remains invisible for the author of the text. To find something in the text, to somehow have an intercourse with the text that produces a monstrosity. Yeah? So if you read Kant, for instance, you get out of Kant not another version of Kantianism, but some kind of anti-Kant. Yeah? It's a very interesting method. And you could use this method in approaching artworks as well. Yeah? It basically means to find something Something is always lurking in the, in the text that escapes the intentions of the writer. Yeah? <coughs> uh, now, you could say that we kind of use this approach in our seminars and in our practice. You know? um, it also means, I think just by using this language of the aspect in the same sentence of Immaculate Conception, yeah? it means that nothing is sacred. There are no sacred cows. And why should there be? How can you be a philosopher if you have sacred cows? The sacred cow can take different forms. It can be Plato, or it can be um, Jeff Wall, or it can be the camera, or it can be, you know, the dark one. You know, there's many sacred cows, or it can be, you know, the laptop. Oh. And, and the learner is kind of straight away putting on the table, you know, find your, find your sacred, secret cows and do it. Tony mentions um, sacred cows. Uh, it brought me thinking of uh, David Bowie, sacred cows, stumble into town, mm. like sacred cows, and such busters. Well, I think. David Bowie is, 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 is very interesting in this, in this respect. That, that, that's something that maybe 
would be worth uh, developing. Did you hear, but did you listen, by the way, to uh, Black Star? Mm -hmm. It is beautiful, no? It is absolutely amazing. Yeah? Did you listen to it? Yeah, and the video. The, the video. video the mm, 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 yeah, yeah I, don't, I don't think I watched the video much, but I've been listening to the, to the album for quite a bit. It was just on, on, on the replay on my phone all the time. And, uh, and yes, it just so somehow really drawing you in. And it's very short as well. Like it, kind of, it ends and you think, well, that's like life, no? It's I think there's more coming though, because there's going to be more released. Yeah, yeah, I read something like that. Uh, anyway, so then let's move to Felix Guattari because there's many other interesting things that um, actually maybe um, Simone, maybe you can continue. We we'll skip a couple of lines and. And we, can, we still read about Deleuze. Maybe you can read to us from this. He discovered an orphan line of thinkers. He discovered an orphan line of thinkers who were tied by no direct descendants, but were united in their opposition to the state philosophy that would nevertheless accord them with minor positions in its canon. Between the Christians, Hume, Spinoza, Nietzsche, and Bergson, there exists a secret link constituted by the critique of negativity, the cultivation of joy, the hatred of interiority, the exteriority of forces and relations, the denunciation of power. Great. So, what he again, um, assuming here, describes the Lose's kind of philosophical method. And the method was to find among all the great philosophers, a kind of a band of brothers, a band of um, fellow travelers who share something, a kind of outsider spirit, and which it puts them in opposition to the state philosophy, which we're going to soon find out. Yeah? In opposition to the institutional philosophy, which privileges, and I think it's just beautiful, uh, because it's a quotation from the from Deleuze himself. Uh, first, an orphan line of thinkers, you know? And it's good to be an orphan in this context. It's good not to come from a heritage. It's good not to have a, a glorious lineage that ties you with the, the greatest, you know? You start from nowhere. You, you, you start from nomadism. You start from just where you are. You are an orphan, you know, found in the dorsal. You know, so that, that, what kind of thought emerges out of this philosophical orphanage. Um, critique of negativity, yeah? To be negative of, about negativity, or crit critical of negativity. And what is negativity? Negativity is dialectics. Negativity is on the one hand, on the other hand. Negativity is black or white, you are either a black person or a white person. You are either European or uh, Oriental. You are either a male or a female. You are either straight or gay. Yeah, this is negativity. This is binary thinking. Yeah, and so Deleuze is looking for philosophers for whom this kind of division into binaries is deeply uncomfortable. And what these people are offering instead Cultivation of joy. Isn't that beautiful? You know? Cultivation of joy. What kind of joy? The joy of creation. The joy of creating concepts. The joy of thinking philosophically. The joy of making art. Yeah? Making art, even painful, difficult, challenging art, can be joyous. And this is very important. And um, I was just... Um, I was uh, reading, uh, for some reason, I got a little bit uh, interested in the Australian Open, in the tennis uh, finals. I didn't watch any of the games, but I read some of the analysis. And uh, there was an interesting analysis of uh, Andy Murray. As you know, he, uh, he lost uh, in the final. But he said, in one of the interviews, he said uh, something like, the point is not who is the better player, but who has a happier life. 
And I thought this is really very, very smart. And it's also something I thought, it's something to kind of take with you on your journey as an artist. You know, the, for, the point is not who is the most famous artist, but who has a happier life, you know? Who has the most joy in making art. And isn't that a nice way uh, of thinking, yeah? Um, and that kind of means that, you know, it's not about how many awards you win, it's not really about, you know, what, what place you get uh, in sort of, uh, you know, in an in a exhibition, or not even what, what mark you get. But how much fun do you manage to get out of your own process of being an artist? You know, that really becomes the measure of your success. Um, so, um, and it's interesting that Deleuze, um, Deleuze played tennis. Um, he even wrote a little bit about, uh, about tennis in some of his books. Um, but um, he also spoke very interestingly about athleticism and what does it really mean to be athletic? Not, not so much, not only in terms of the body, but also what does it mean to be athletic in your spirit? Make one day we touch on that. Um, so that, that just gives you a little taste, the cultivation of joy, the hatred of interiority. What is interiority? It's everything that is kind of inward looking, yet internal. Interiority is whatever is defined by very clear borders, yeah? Whatever is sort of homogenous, you know, this is us and they are them, you know, we are who we are, you know, we are not like them. You know, this. So you can you can hear the political overtones in that, um, and and the denunciation. You know, I can blur it. And the denunciation of power. Yeah, opposition or um, challenging of power. Okay, and now let's move to Gotari. And do you want to read it still, or do you want some translation? Okay. Felix Guattari <coughs> is a practicing psychoanalyst and a lifelong political activist. He has worked since the mid-1950s at La Borde, an experimental psychiatric clinic founded by the Canadian family Jean Laurie. Guattari himself was among Lacan's earliest trainees, and although he never severed his ties with Lacan's Freudian school, the group therapy practice at La Borde took him in a very different direction. The aim at the board was to abolish the hierarchy between doctor and patient in favor of an interactive group dynamic that would bring the experiences of both to full expression in such a way as to produce a collective critique of the power relations in society as a whole. The central perspective is to promote human relations that do not automatically fall into roles or stereotypes, but open up to fundamental relations of metaphysical kind that bring out the most radical and basic alienations of madness or neurosis. Let's stop here for a second. So Deleuze, as you saw, classically trained philosopher who turned to the outsiders within the philosophical canon with whom he built this liaison and developed his, uh, in a sense, developed his own philosophical lineage based on the outsiders or the parias or the orphans of the philosophical of philosophical thought. Um, Guattari, on the other hand, is not a philosopher, not, not, not a cl classically trained philosopher, but a psychoanalyst who was one of the early students of Jacques Lacan. Lacan, uh, he is a well-known French psychiatrist, um, perhaps maybe the, the second most famous name in psychiatry. Well, no. No. Okay. Okay. But but you said that you are interested in the mirror stage. Yeah. Yeah. I, yeah. I can tell about that. Would you like? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so um, he arguments that the infant who is uh, looking into the mirror um, is. Um, developing kind of a self-identity because before we look ourselves into the mirror we always see ourselves partial 
and um, that's what he's talking about. I mean, that's what I'm discovering. Great. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So um, that the sense of the question is for Lacan: At what point the the newborn child, well, let's say not the not the newborn, but the the toddler, develops a sense of self-identity that he, he he or she is not the extension of the body of the mother, but a autonomous person. Yeah, and for Lacan, that happens when the child recognizes their reflection in the mirror as being themselves. Yeah, it's interesting, for instance, with cats. That some cats are fascinated by the reflection, <laughs> and others just couldn't care less. They just don't exist for that. <laughs> yeah, um, I don't know what that means. Uh, <laughs> uh, okay. So, but but Guattari, while he is a student of Lacan, is also a kind of like anti anti Lacanian. Yeah. Also, he's never severed his ties with Lacan's Freudian school. The group therapy practice that Lacan took him in a very different direction. So first what is important is that the therapy in Lacan clinic was a group therapy. Yeah? This is very important. It's not part of the college. It's a group. Yeah? So there is a kind of social dimension. But what is really essential is that the philosophy of this clinic in Lacan was that to challenge and to question the way psychoanalysis since Freud instituted this relationship of here is the therapist and here is the patient or the client. The therapist is the authority, the client is the pathology. And the client comes to the therapist with a problem, the therapist's role is to heal or improve or bring the client back into the fold of normality. Yeah? For the labor clinic, that was problematic because it already institutes a certain hierarchy. There is another problem here, is that the way Freudian analysis works is that in the very classic Freudian psychoanalytic method, the therapist is sitting behind the client or the patient so while, while, while you are at the session, lying on the couch, you don't see the, 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 the therapist. Uh, you are, the therapist is basically invisible. The therapist becomes like this taboo subject. You may not ask the therapist anything about themselves, you know. So how was your week? You know, the, you cannot ask these kind of questions. Um, you cannot ask them anything about themselves. They become like the taboo. They become this like, like mother's vagina. You may not look at it, you may not touch it, you may not ask questions about it. You you know, it is it's like the evil thing, you know? And because the therapist is this taboo subject, the client or the patient can project their evil feelings onto the therapist, then they become exposed in the session and then they can be analyzed. Yeah? So the session, the therapy session in a sense recreates the Oedipal environment of the family by placing the therapist where the mother, which is the taboo incest, the incestual taboo subject, should be. Yeah. And then your feel your incestual feelings towards your mother or your um, incestuous feelings towards your father, they can become explored because they become the feelings you have towards the therapist. You know, so classically, you know, people fall in love with the therapist, you know, and all these things, and that allows. So that's that's basically that. Oh, one of the elements that make psychoanalytical therapy in its classical formulation work. Yeah, that's exactly what the Bordeaux, with the with the, sorry, with the labor clinic, is trying to deconstruct or somehow get away from. And the argument there, it seems to me, that as long as you have this hierarchies, yeah? you must operate from a certain fixed notion of what it means to be normal. And, and then to treating a patient is always about somehow making them fit this preconceived notion of normality. But 
what if we abandon this hierarchy? This hierarchy? What if um, interactive group dynamic that would bring the experiences of both the therapist or the, the, the psychotherapist, psychoanalyst and the client into full expression? What if we abandon this hierarchy? What if we create an environment in which the notion of normality is expanded? Yeah? So rather than feeling that you need to fit a certain narrow definition of normality, we expand the definition of normality so you already fit it. Do you understand what I'm saying? So instead of, instead of somehow curing the, and then we're giving to you very, very schematically, just because I want you to um, grasp a certain principle. Instead of teaching or enabling the patient to change their behavior in order to fit society, the, the experiment in laboratories, let's redefine society in a way that makes you fit it. Let's redefine the definition of normal so you will find yourself not outside but within. And one way it was done, for instance, is that every morning there would be a group meeting of all the people who are in the clinic, both the patients and the doctors and the nurses and the janitors, and all the tasks for the day are divided between everyone. Yeah? So then someone gets assigned to go to town and buy some provisions, and someone gets assigned to um, sit on the telephone, and someone needs to do cooking, and someone needs to um, work in the garden. And in that way, a certain non-hierarchical, maybe you can call it horizontal structure rather than vertical structure being established, within which um, one might feel more accepted or perhaps less pathological. Yeah? Because the argument, the philosophical argument behind it is that what we call uh, neurosis or what we call um, schizophrenia is perhaps it is a healthy response to the impossible demands society puts on individuals to make them fit, you know, the, kind of the capitalist narrative of um, accumulation of capital, you know, and if you don't fit this narrative, then you somehow something is wrong with you, yeah. So it almost says, and here I'm slightly alluding to the British anti-psychiatry practitioner R.D. Lane, um, who said um, it's the society that is ill, not the patient. The okay. Is that the society is made of human beings. Sorry. The society is like this. Society is human beings. Who said that? I, I don't know who said that. <laughs> <laughs> but it's like, it's so easy to say, ah, the society. Mm -hmm. But uh, you forget even that, that society is always yourself and everybody else. Kind of. But how do we behave? Like, do, do, do you turn something to behave? Like, how do you, where is the human, where is the human in the being? Are we animals or? Um, like, but like here, of course, we are in a lovely pushy bubble, but out there, and I say out there, yeah, yeah. in the studio, is studio and social psychosis is, is great. If society was like this, it would be amazing, but as you come out of these, of this space, it's like... It's different. Yeah, it's different. <laughs> I've noticed it's different. I don't know. Maybe I'm just <laughs> I'm, I'm just saying that it's so easy to say that society is like this. That it's like we are society, and you and me yeah. and everybody. And it's like your actions every minute that defines what society is like. And that might be here or might be outside. It doesn't really matter. That's all. Sorry. Sorry. Can I ask you to read one more thing? And then, and then someone else. I can I will ask you to read from here. Uh, as the Kenyan and then I was close up. As the Kenyan schools of psychoanalysis gained ground in psychiatry, once the contractual ethical relationship between the analyst and the experience bound analysis became as much of a target of watery as the legal uh, bondage of the institutionalized patient in the conventional state home.
hospital. He came to occupy the same position in relation to psychoanalysis as he had all along in relation to the parties on the left, an ultra-opposition within the opposition. Okay, great. An ultra-opposition within the opposition, yeah? So it's not enough to be left. It's, it's, it's essential to be anti-left within the left. Yeah? In a sense, yeah, yeah, this is... You remember the discussion between, between uh, Foucault and Chomsky? Chomsky was left. Foucault was anti-left. In a sense, you could say um, that that's something similar. You could, maybe not. I, would, I wanted to draw an analogy, analogy between... Could we say uh, that the third non Sorry? Third non uh, like the third um, uh, no, it's actually, it's actually the other way. It's tertium not, is not that Darwin. It's a sentence by Vaslavic who argued about... Uh, um, there is no third way. As well. There is no third way. But there actually, is like third way between uh, like this right and left, or let's like, say um, not anti, but being like in, a diff, uh, in terms of rhizoma. Like many differences, rather than staying into system as Foucault had argued in the structuralism, but going out of the structuralism, uh, looking for not a coexistence so of two systems as the Hegelian dialectic, but uh, not a synthesis, but a tertium, like a, a third thing. Yeah, yeah. So it, which allowed the possibility of differences. The, the expression you refer to, if, if, if I understand it correctly, is that. There is no third way. The, yeah, there is third There way. is a third way. Yeah, yeah. So say it again. But yeah, certain non data means like the third is not data, but it's kind of the logic of the let's 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 leave it. Let's leave it for the, for a second it's because I think it, it gets it gets too complicated. Uh, but I think what what you are right about is that for Guattari, as it is for Deleuze, there is a third way. It's not enough to say there is the right and there is the left, and you have to choose whether you are on one side or the other. You can also be, there is also a third way, you can be anti-left within the left, which doesn't put you, of course, in the right side, but it puts you in opposition to the left itself. What that might mean in practice <coughs> is that you will direct your energies not at fighting the right-wing parties, but in exposing the problems and the holes in the left. Yeah? And that becomes the political project of Guattari and also of Deleuze. But it's interesting here, I just want to direct your attention, uh, this, that the Oedipal relationship between the analyst and the transference-bound analysant what does it mean, a trans uh, transference bound analysant? It is incumbent on the, an analysant is the person who comes to the therapy, yeah? It is incumbent on the analysant to transfer their feelings, transfer their Oedipal feelings onto the therapist. Yeah? That's basically, the, like, this is the confessional element of the therapy. Yeah? The feelings you have towards your parents, the feelings you have towards your mother and father, the, in therapy, you have to transfer them onto the therapist so then they can be analyzed. Yeah? Um, that is what, that is the institutional mode of uh, psychotherapy or of psychoanalysis. And the, the, the opposition, this internal opposition to psychoanalysis from within psychoanalysis, this anti psychotherapy that what are champions um, is also the model he is using in his political action as ultra opposition within the opposition. I think it's beautiful. Ultra opposition within the opposition. Yeah, that's what being radical really means. Yeah, as I already told you around this table, you know, it's okay to be radical. Uh, okay. Um, how are we doing? Any questions so far? Right. So here we have a bit of a portrait 
for lack of a better word, of Deleuze as the philosopher who looks for the orphans and the bastards of philosophy. And Guattari, the psychotherapist, the psychoanalyst who is anti-psychotherapy or anti-analysis. Um, so that's an interesting, uh, interesting bunch. Okay, let's have a look now at um, this paragraph. Um, could someone read to us the, the, the section starts with state philosophy? Thank you very much. That was very, very well read. Uh, could someone read maybe from this side of the table? Give the balance. Rupert? Okay. Okay. Now, this is, we finished with um, their life stories. And let's now have a look at what is really the essence or the main project of this book. State philosophy is another word for the representational thinking that has characterized Western metaphysics since Plato, but has suffered from at least momentary setback during the last quarter century at the hands of Jacques Derrida, Michel Foucault, and post structuralist theory generally. As described by Deleuze, it reposes on the double identity of the thinking subject and of the concepts it creates and to which it lends its own presumed attribute of sameness and constancy. The subject, its concepts, and also the objects in the world to which the concepts are applied have a shared internal essence, the self-resemblance at the basis of identity. Representational thought is analogical. Its concern is to establish a correspondence between these symmetrically structured domains. The faculty of judgment is the policeman of analogy, showing that each of the three terms is honestly itself, and that the proper correspondence is obtained. In thought, its end is truth. In action, justice. Okay, that's enough for now. Now, Simona, I noticed that you were nodding. So do you want to say what you were nodding to? And why is that? How do you understand that? How do I understand that? It, I understand it in a way of uh, it being linear, so having a certain structure rather than being multiplied and sort of in a sense of um, authoritarian power and then dispersion. So it moves away from dispersion and very good. Did you hear that? That was very good. Now, uh, I think that what I highlight here, to me, it resonates with a discussion we had here last week. For, for instance, you, Julie, were asking, what is the connection between subjectivity and representation? I think if I'm not mistaken, we had this conversation, yeah? So, that seems to be, there seems to be a kind of answer here. And it's interesting that suddenly, we have a new term coming forward, state philosophy. State philosophy. What is state philosophy? Or maybe state art for that matter. I read recently, by the way, and I, will share, I can share the link with you if you like, that um, American uh, abstract painting is basically the invention of the CIA. It's good, isn't it? The CIA sponsored American ab abstract painters as part of the Cold War effort to show that you know um, we are we allow our artists to express themselves freely, while in Soviet Russia they all have to do um, social realism. And, and with that, they say that politics <coughs> world and a that it was, you know, there's those conspiracy theories that go with that. Maybe, but even even without conspiracy theories, it is quite clear that CIA has a formidable uh, modernist uh, American modernism collection in their walls, and it was used as a weapon in as a weapon in a war. So here is an example of art, state art. Yeah? And um, so state philosophy, we need to really understand our relationship to this notion of state <coughs> philosophy. Uh, state philosophy is another word for representational thinking. 
Okay, so the, the penny should be dropping now. State philosophy is another word for representational thinking. We already know by now what is representational thinking. Representational thinking is analogical. What does it mean to say that it is analogical? It means that it is connecting the beginning and the end. There is a direct line. Remember the um, <coughs> remember the, the, this painting? Now, it pains me to use it as an example of representational thinking because I love this painting. You know? And I don't think it would be fair to say that this is kind of state apparatus. Uh, but I, 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 I really think it is, it is just completely, uh, completely sublime. At the same time, I want to use it because we discussed it last week. Uh, it is representational. Representational painting. Why is it representational painting? Because it is analogical. What does it mean analogical? It is it's drawing an analogy between what is out there and what is over here in the canvas. Let's just um, drop that here and drop that here. So we can. Would you say? Yes. Would you agree that Adrian Hurst is creating, creating state art? Yes. Do you want to develop that? No. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay. It's a very interesting question. I think. Well, it would be very interesting to think about it. I think that there, there could be an argument uh, made in this way. Um, so let's let's just have another look at um, what it says. So state philosophy is another word for representational thinking. Da, 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 da. And what does it mean? Uh, it reposes. So what is representational thinking? It reposes on a double identity of the thinking subject and of the concepts it creates and to which it lends its own presumed attributes of sameness and constancy. So this is, this painting, you can see, it's, what does it mean that it is, it has attributes of sameness and constancy within the painting? Well, for one thing, it is continuous. Yeah, there are no interruptions within the painting. It's not, that, it's not made of different elements that are just kind of stuck together. Yeah, it is so that's consistency. Yeah, it's interesting. Consistency, homogeneity. What does it mean to be consistent? For instance, anyone here plays a musical instrument? Yeah, what, what do you play? Uh, I play guitar, Okay, great. So let's say, do you know you can play within a scale? Yeah, if let's say you, you take a scale and you use all, only the notes within the scale. You might say that this is consistent play. Yeah? It guaranteed to be harmonious. Every note you will hit within a scale will be harmonious. That's why you can very easily improvise on a guitar. Yeah? However, if you start jumping from one scale to another, or if you start, let's say, to retune your instrument in the middle of playing, it stops being consistent. It stops being, um, what is it? Um, it stops uh, being Kind of, you lose the notion of sameness, you lose harmony, and you enter kind of very difficult to hear modern sound. Yeah, does it make sense? Yeah. So sameness, harmony, consistency, <coughs> they are pleasant things. This is a very pleasant thing. Yeah? It's, it's not challenging our vision because it corresponds to how we think we see. Yeah? So go back and think at, at your own practice and ask, you know, you, you have elements of sameness, you also have say elements of discontinuity. Yeah? Now you have a way to look at what you do from the perspective of 
state philosophy and representational thinking. Yeah? Now, as you can see from, from Vermeer, status and consistency can produce marvelous results. Yeah? So this is not a suggestion to somehow um, destroy or eliminate uh, all consistency in your work. You know? That would be really a uh, unnecessary end. It will create another form of consistency. If you will consistently eliminate all form of consistency, you will end up in another consistency. Yeah? So that's, that's the trap. That is the danger. Yeah? What is the solution? To understand that consistency has its power. Yeah? Use it wisely. Like, you know, a Stanley knife. Or a brain knife. So do you think that we can make our brain work in that way? So yes. that means that uh, every person could be considered as an artist. So you could be in the educate and as an engineer and then you could be an artist instead of where born as it is. Well, let's say I don't believe that you need to be touched by the muses to be an artist. No, of course not. Uh, I think you need, to be, you, need, well, you need to want to be an artist. I don't think someone who doesn't want to be an artist can be taught that. You need to want it. Well, you are here for a reason, yeah? You are here... Yeah, but what happened with all that person who applied um, at the same time he did, and they are not here? So that means that they are not part of this group. Why? They are square. They are the earth. Uh, Irene, Irene, this, this, I, 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 I think I can see where you are going with it. It is interesting. And it's interesting. I'm not saying it's not. Uh, it's, a good, it's a good question. I think, I think it's a question that you need to find an answer to. Do you think that, well, Joseph Boyce, the great, the great German artist, Joseph Beuys, said that everyone's an artist. Does he mean by that that everyone is a painter? No, I think he means by that that whether, as an engineer, you can also be creative. As a, someone who mends washing machines, there is an element of desire and passion and creativity in that as well. Yeah? Um, so there is, a, there is a way to build this argument. Yeah? I think that's not really what uh, this text is, uh, is suggesting. Um, and also, I think, if you feel that I'm kind of giving you a formula how to make art, this is not about that. I'm kind of saying, in your work, you're already using consistency. You're bound to make things that, that come together and connect, and you have also elements that disconnect. They're just in the nature of how things are. Whenever you write, there will be things that flow one from another, and then there will be things that don't. And this text allows us, or at least encourages us, to identify these moments and to be aware of them. Yeah? So what I'm calling for is an awareness to the way your own practice is already organized. Yeah? So I think, I think that yeah, was that. Uh, yeah. It's not, it, you know, there is no recipe. If there was a recipe, what would be the point in making art? Is yeah, there wouldn't be point, there wouldn't be art. Like there wouldn't be art. Yes? Is it representational thinking think about to be an artist? I don't know. Because uh, it's, a position, it's a social position of the artist. So the willingness to be an artist, it's kind of, the, uh, I want to be a status symbol. No, it's a symbol. Like, uh, and so it, it's still a... Uh, uh, this representation. So do, do, to be identified with a, with a name, no? I think it has Look. a lot to do with the intent, like with the intention. Like for instance, like you have things uh, like down, like where you enter you, King's Cross, you have this like huge wall of lights and stuff like that. If I had gone and done that and said that it was going to be art, then it would be considered a great art piece. But these yeah, people were, were awesome. employed by, you know, London Underground to create this thing, and they said we want something that's monumental and sort of lights up and is really interactive. And because that they were employed by this company to do it, and they were you know contracted, then it now becomes just something that was done to produce money, or you know, so that way they got paid. Yeah, but my no, my discussion was far. I mean, if you like, Iran said 
uh, be an artist. It's not about uh, you become an artist, probably, I think, because uh, it's not about reaching, otherwise, it's still a representation of thinking. That I, think, I think if I hear you correctly, Maria, you basically say that art is also institutional. Artist. I read this sentence last year at Arts Council. There was written, uh, the, uh, the I is in the artist, not in the art. Okay. And I think it really... Is the I, the I the like... I, the, there is an I in the artist. The I like, like this I, or I, the... I like ah, the ego. Like the ego, okay, okay. And not in the artist. Uh, there is an I in the artist, and not in the art. Okay. Mm. I don't know what I think about that. Maybe I don't think anything about it. Yeah. But, um, <laughs> but uh, <coughs> no, look, what, what the, the point, if, if, if I hear your point, is that where well, we are in the institution, yes, yeah, so in a sense, state philosophy isn't that the kind of, a, the state makes art, the state creates this environment where art can be made. Correct. Deleuze spent all his life in the institution. He was a professor in the university. Um, and sometimes you need to be in the institution in order to be a good anarchist. But yeah? also Joseph Beuys was in an institution, he got fired because he considered everyone as an artist and invited all of the people mm -hmm. from the street, more or less, to come in. Yeah. And that's why he got fired for it. <laughs> um, so, just, I, th I, th I think, I think it, it, it is a very interesting point that you are raising, Maria, because we are, as artists, that live you know in the 21st century in this specific society we will always somehow find ourselves dealing with institutions either working within them or applying for money from them or making art for them and um, the question is how within that environment which is given we still find our own pockets of freedom and of subversion and of the possibility to do something that we want to do that is the question, yes. Wouldn't that then mean that philosophy has been defeated? Philosophy? It's been defeated because you're already existing in that sphere, in that zone, saying that this is an institution. It can only exist within this institution. I, yeah, the, I think, it, yeah, well, you can say that, that philosophy was defeated. I think philosophy was defeated always. Um, yes. Um, and yet, still, some kind of free thinking is possible, you know, the proof is in this table. You know, we are sitting here, thinking about things, developing our own senses about what makes something a work of art and how things work, and we can do it. Um, can we take it out of this room into the big world? Well, it's hard, you know? It is, it is a fight, and you always will have to fight for the possibility of being creative, for the possibility of being joyous, you know, for the right not to be sad, for the right not to be negative. Um, but I think, I think the fight is, you know, is still there. So I don't think it is defeated. Yes. But considering that we are in that inside that sphere, and we will only exist inside the sphere because of the society we live in, uh, wouldn't then be making art be an infinite regress? It's just infinite it will, regress. It will just it will just be that because we are always in this world. Any form of free thinking will always be restricted by being inside this. Yes, it will always be restricted. It will also be restricted by many other things. So by the fact in, a, in essence, all art and all philosophy that will come from this point or has been will always be state philosophy. Will always be state art because it will just keep on. Introducing new forms of making state yes. art, or state philosophy. This argument can be made, uh, and yet I think the evidence is that you, from time to time, encounter work that just fills you with happiness, and that also is possible. And it happens to me almost every Monday when I come to see one of your creeds. Something is happening there that is interesting, is new, that is original. So it's also somehow possible, even though. I agree with you that, you know, within the environment we live, it's not possible to break away. It's not possible to set up some kind of independent commune. It will not will sever its ties with the, the current political, socio-economic situation. It is not possible. And yet, some pockets of freedom and joy and happiness are still available. The question is, 
how to create them and how to maximize them. I have one last uh, yes. point to make. Uh, a way out or a way to cope with this or deal with it would be serendipity. Right? Would be? Serendipity. Serendipity. You mean like accident? Yeah. Happy, happy, last chance. Because you, the way, at least Lofi, I think from what I've been reading, uh, has worked is through this, is by saying we will not be in this, we will not exist in this restriction, we look at it from another perspective. Step out. Yeah. Considering that as much as you can keep stepping out, you will still be in close in the serendipity plays of the major role. I think you're right, yeah. But serendipity you need to understand in a bigger sense as chaos, the forces of the absurd, the forces of chaos, the irrational forces that operate in the world. And you're right, connecting to these forces and somehow drawing your energy from them is a really crucial strategy for an artist. Let's see what, what let's, let's again make a point of trying to explore what state philosophy really means. I think the questions you've been asking now are relevant and we kind of we keep asking them all the time. Um, I think it's great that the text you know, provokes you to, uh, to ask these questions. So this representational thinking, which is the same as state philosophy, yeah, representational thinking is based on double identity, double identity. The thinking subject, who is the, who is the thinking subject? Subject is the artist, is the subject of the painting, is the viewing subject who looks at the artwork, uh, and of the concepts it creates and to which it lends its own presumed attributes of sameness and constancy. So here is, as I said, in this painting you see sameness and constancy operating, and and I, I want you to understand these are not negative terms, yeah. Sameness and constancy creates a beautiful, harmonious painting. Yeah? Who wouldn't want to spend the afternoon looking at it? You know? It is just marvelous. Yeah? That's the power of sameness and constancy. However, it also establishes the notion of the thinking subject. Because it implies, it, it presupposes the person for whom this painting is constant and continuous, and this person is the thinking subject. Yeah? So when you look at the painting, you also, in a sense, you don't only see the representation of the city of Delft, you also see some, something about how your own mind is organized, and the painting kind of tells you, just as this picture of the city is so uniform and continuous and homogeneous and um, rhythmic, so is your thinking, so is your own identity, is continuous and complete and wholesome and, and harmonious. So by looking at the painting as something complete, you also get the notion of yourself as something complete. Compare that to looking at a cubist painting, yeah, that looks at, um, let's say, uh, Well, it's easy to see that, let's say, a cubist painting suggests to you that your own mind is not complete, that it's all made of little bits, that it's all like little sh shreds of glass, that there is no one picture. You yourself are like the painting. Do, do, you, do you get it? Yeah? And, and I don't even think cubism is that radical. Yeah, it's all this kind of little, little, little pictures and frames. And, um, but, do you get that? It's really important that you will understand that the painting doesn't only speak to you about the lovely city of Delft, but also about the lovely mind, yeah? about the spotless mind that you bring with which to contemplate the image. But is that the historical way of placing it? Yes. Is he trying to summarize that that is a way of thinking? It is political. It is political. Yes, of course, because it is a state philosophy. I mean, like historicizing and saying that 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 is our thinking. That's a kind of thinking that happened then. 
but it happens now as well. Yeah. I, mean, I mean, the connection between uh, what Vasumi is saying here in the introduction and fine art or painting is a connection we make here. Yeah, it's our own way of putting some flesh on the bones of this discourse. Mm -hmm. I think Masumi is not saying that state philosophy was there and now we have something else. He, he says, for a very short while, people like Deleuze, Foucault, Derrida managed to challenge it. Whether we still succeed in challenging it, whether it is possible to challenge it and not be um, ignored after 9-11, for instance, is a question. You know, I don't know. I think I think state philosophy is still looming pretty large, you know, uh, maybe larger than ever, um, judging by uh, many recent events. But so yeah, it's it's it is historical. Well, it's it's which doesn't mean that it is in the past. Mm -hmm. So, so yes, yeah. so it's continually evolving because every time it's challenged. Who? What is evolving? State philosophy. Because it's challenged and then that becomes part of the state. It of the is, theory. well, yes, it assimilates into it new developments. For instance, cubism. Yeah, because cubism then becomes, you know, just a commodity with a high value. Uh, true. It, but at the same time, the core values of sameness and continuity and subjectivity, they don't change very much. Even though I think the argument is that even postmodern thinking, Let's say um, there is a very interesting research about the way the Israeli military, the Israeli army, is using Deleuze in planning its um, aggressive uh, incursions into the Palestinian cities. Yeah, I can talk to you about it a little bit more in the future. Um, but yeah, I think you're right. Actually, come to think about it, you are right. That is the nature of state philosophy. It really, it really is capable of absorbing all subversive movements within itself. And yet, subversive movements keep happening. Yeah? And what is subversive today might not be subversive tomorrow. As I mentioned last week, uh, and uh, about 15, 20 years ago, fetish clubs were really sites of freedom and very subversive. And, and these days there are sort of stag nights there and hen parties and you can go to Topshop and buy all your fetish gear in one place. Uh, uh, so it is, you know, in the past, you know, it was, it was very different. Uh, so, and yet, other pockets of subversion become available. <clears throat> so there's never any stagnation there. And as an artist, you will also be constantly, you, will, you are all the time on the move from one technique, one method, one, one approach to another. Yeah? If you want to keep your space outside the state apparatus or the state philosophy, you never, you cannot make yourself static. Because if you, are, if you become static, then you become the state. Okay, yes. State philosophy is a representation of time. No, I mean, like, if you want to experience to, like, me, work, but what does it mean? Good. Now, it's, it's a very good question. What is state philosophy? State philosophy is, but let's look at what, what it's said here. Uh, the thinking subject. Well, state philosophy implies that you, or as the subject, or the person, you are rational, logical, continuous, and <coughs> thinking, and it reposes on double identity, the thinking subject and the concepts it creates and to which it lends its own presumed attributes of sameness and constancy. The sameness and constancy is state philosophy. The, the state wishes to establish a space which is homogeneous, continuous, and safe. Yeah? Does that make sense? Um, like, if, you, if you explain what a uh, lemma is, you explain that it's a yellow fruit, and it's a citrus, it's a citrus family, uh, as in this kind of way, I think it's important. I think that is really 
that is the equivalent. And the reason it is not simple is because the state is not a simple thing. Uh, it's not an object. Yeah? Um, it is us. We are the state. And the question is, how, what is the, for what reason the state, what is the claim state makes for its authority? For what reason the state can come to you and say, pay your taxes, Alexander? On what basis does the state say saying that? Why should you obey? Why the state can make the claim that you should obey the state? Is it because for fear of punishment? Well, there is obviously punishment, but not only. The, the basic claim the state makes is that it is only asking me to do things which are rational. This is the claim the state makes. I will give you a, an example. Yesterday, I opened the door to my flat, and the doormat disappeared. And I thought, what, who would steal the doormat? I even, wanted, I even wanted to leave a note saying, look, if you are that struggling, then let me know what else you might need. <laughs> uh, but then I called uh, the, the organization that runs kind of the state, and they said, yeah, there was a circular. We took all the all doormats away because they are fire hazard and we warned you. Yeah? Now, to me that was completely ridiculous. Totally, totally mad. And I went to speak to this person. <laughs> I was very, very angry. But, don't even go there because cats are not allowed. <laughs> So no, we had, to do, we had to have this conversation in the corridor. We couldn't get into the house for fear of him saying, oh, and another thing. <laughs> uh, anyway, I hope, I hope they will never get to see this recording. <laughs> this is state philosophy. On what basis they could come and take my doormat? <laughs> Their argument was that it is the rational thing to do. This is fire hazard. To me, it's completely insane. Yeah? But they say, well, if you look at your lease, then on page 25, you know, paragraph you know, 200 something, it says something like that, you know, there shouldn't be anything in the corridor. The anything in the corridor includes also the doorbell. Therefore, we came into the doorbell. That is the basis of this claim. For me, it's completely ridiculous, but the state made a rational claim. That is the basis of the power of the state, the rational claim. What does it mean to make a rational claim? It means we already know that rationality or rational thinking is a representational thinking. Yeah? So, does it help? Yeah. Good. <laughs> Good. Without that, if, let's say, the state would come and say, you know what? We took your doormat because I'm a new guy here. I, I'm in charge. That's what I feel like. You know, I'm, I'm the head of the estate now. And, you know, I just wanted to start like this. Um, and that, so a, a medieval feudal king could say something like that. You know, give me all your free uh, new firstborns or something like that. You know, yeah, I just feel like, you know, that's, you know, Caligula could say, you know, I just want your doormat, you know, <laughs> bring, bring, bring your doormat. <laughs> I will have a pyramid in my name, it may not be that, you know. Uh, and you will have to do it, because if you don't do it, they will just throw you to the crocodiles. Yeah? But this is different. If he couldn't point to the article in the lease, if he couldn't point to uh, a rational reason, it wouldn't hold. There has to be some rational argument. Yeah? So that's how state operates. That's how representation or rationality or rational logic is the basis of state power, modern state power. It is not based on the authority of the king that comes from God, yeah? but on, the, on, on saying, look, you elect us to make rules, it was your rational choice to elect this government, 
the government makes rational decisions about the laws that this country should have, you now should obey them because it's all rational. And you are it's yourself rational. Now, what happens if you are not rational? Well, then you go to the clinic. You know, we have a place for people like you. <laughs> or you go to an answer. That's another one. <laughs> they will take the break. Okay, five minutes. Maybe five. I somehow feel much better now about the loss of my dogma. I think I realized that it was for a reason. Because I, we could use it to explain how the state operates. Uh, so, so here, here, I just want to we move we move on to the Deleuze and Guattari, which we're going to hear the voice in a minute. Uh, but just before, let's see what else is happening in this uh, in this part. So we spoke about the sameness and consistency. The sameness and consistency. And then the subject, its concept. Oh, I'm going to Because that speaks directly to the question Julie asked last week. The subject its concept and also the objects in the world to which the concepts are applied have a shared internal essence. This is the definition of state philosophy. That the, the subject, which is you, the concepts, which is your culture and your thinking, and the objects in the world have shared consistency, have shared internal essence. <coughs> what is this internal essence? The internal essence of all of this, of you, your thinking, your things, the environment you live in, the family, the society, the, the, the institution, everything has one shared internal essence. This shared internal essence is representation. You are a subject. Why? What does it mean to be a subject? It means that you understand the world as a representation, as a logical construction. The world is logical. The objects within the world are logical. The state that organizes the world around you is logical. Everything is logical in this logical world. This is, yes. But that's not the case with all the digital. I think people are very... Correct. <laughs> Correct. That is, we just now exploring the meaning of state philosophy. Uh, now, the self-resemblance at the basis of identity. This is, Julie, I'm glad you came in. The self-resemblance at the basis of identity. What does it mean to have identity? It means to have self-resemblance. It means that this picture, to some extent, resembles you. Do you understand why I can say that? Not because you look like this, but because you are consistent and continuous and harmonious like this. Any questions? This is really key to understand in order for us to move forward and explore why that might be a problem, as Siobhan already uh, was indicating. Yeah? So this is, to some extent, a mirror of your own identity. When you look at a painting like this, you see yourself as homogeneous, continuous, harmonious, meaningful. Everything is there for a reason. There's nothing there that is 
that does not belong. Equally, there's nothing about you that does not belong. There's nothing here that breaks the surface. There's nothing here that subverts the illusion of representation. Equally, there's nothing about you that is subversive in relation to the state. There's nothing, there, there is nothing about you that breaks away from the given order. Okay. The representational thought is analogical. Its concern is to establish a correspondence between these symmetrically structured domains. Yeah? What are the symmetrically structured what, what, what does it mean to establish a correspondence between the symmetrically structured domains? Yeah? It means everything is connected, everything is analogical, you are, you belong to your family, you have roots, you have connections. That's what it means to be analogical. You are an analogy. In the same way that your art or your practice or your photography is analogical to reality. The artist makes a painting that is analogical to reality. You are analogical to your family. You are analogical. To the, the head of the family is like the head of the state. In the, kind of, the family is the state in the microcosm. Everything is organized in this analogical fashion. Yeah? So you can see how authority is being established in this way. Okay. The faculty of judgment is the policeman of analogy. Yeah? What does it mean the faculty of judgment? How do we know that this painting is really analogical to the <coughs> view from the window? Because we judge it. Yeah? How do I know that you are who you say you are in your identity card? Because I judge the resemblance. Yeah? So in order for there to be analogy, there has to be judgment. So the faculty of judgment is the policeman of analogy, assuring that each of the three terms is honesty itself and the proper correspondences obtained. In thought, its end is truth. In action, justice. So it was just to take my dormant away. It was just, yeah, because it was in the law, because it was rational, yeah? That's justice. In thought, its end is truth. In art, is, is, its end is realism. In law, its end is justice, yeah? That is the framework within which state philosophy operates. That is enough from the introduction. I mean, there will be some interesting other things to read here uh, about the nomad thought, but we're going to get some of it from the from the horse's mouth and we move to the uh, to the book itself. Okay. Uh, I love it. Okay, so for some reason, and disappointingly, the, the, the front page of this chapter is, is not right in this photocopy. That's what it's supposed to look like. It's supposed to have here one introduction. Rising. I don't know why it's not in the protocol, but one introduction, rising. Okay, now, every chapter in this book begins with an image. Okay, and this is the image that opens, one, or opens chapter one, rising, introduction. Okay, so, before we begin to read the text, Let's look at that. What do you get? What do you understand? Think about what we just read about state philosophy. What do you understand? Okay, um, any, any thoughts? There's no harmony. No harmony. 
if you don't know, if you don't know, let's say, how to read music, will you be able to say whether this is uh, a sad tune or a happy one? Is it melodic? Is it um, what kind of feeling it gives? It's constant, it's rhythmical, yeah, it's rhythmical, it's constant. Uh, <coughs> is it a sad tune or a happy one? Happy. Why do you think so? Because the, no the, co <coughs> the, the, the notes make like this. So there is coming down, I don't know, I'm not able to read, but there is a coming down and going up. Okay, okay, come, okay, 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 okay. Now, now let's look at the, at this. <coughs> is it a sad tune or a happy tune, or something else? Entirely? It would be completely dissonant. It would be completely yes. dissonant. Yeah. Would it be a lullaby? <laughs> Maybe. Maybe. <laughs> <laughs> but for who? <laughs> Um, it, um, you can, you know, there is some, it's almost, I would say, it's almost like it already plays in your ear. It already plays in your ear, it's somewhat angular. There is a violence there. There is a certain aggression. Yeah? The very big gaps. Yeah? These sort of drops. Yeah? There is a lot of going around and around and around. Yeah, it's it's a little bit like kind of Jackson Pollock on the piano. It's almost kind of impossible as, as you know music because you go from one I don't know how to say that in English. You go from one Stay. to the, yeah. yeah to the other. How how can you read it? Possibly read it. Exactly. It, it, it is it is a impossible music, and yet. Impossible music, it's still kind of music. Yeah? Now, maybe, maybe you're right, maybe there is no instrument on which that could be played, but in a sense, that is not the point. That communicates certain, <coughs> um, and also that, that, that is quite interesting because that suggests that this whole should be taken very seriously. Yeah? Um, the instructions here for each state uh, and, and how. Each, uh, each line should have its own timbre or its own um, feeling. So here you have, in a sense, in this one image, a whole program for how to overcome state philosophy. Remember what we said earlier? Consistency, harmony, symmetry, continuity. We don't have any of that here. Yeah, none of that. It's not continuous, it's not harmonious, it's not symmetrical. It's definitely, yes. But maybe for the person who did that, this harmony is uh, uh, symmetric, is uh, all of that thing, not because we don't. Is it symmetrical for you? Because the, they have lines, uh, uh, one going up and another one going down, and also um, there are color, similar colors on each side. The black one, you can see there is more. Okay, so there is there is a certain logic here, yeah, and there is a certain rhythm. It just it's a very different approach. What is interesting is even the lines. You see how normally in musical notation there are lines, and on the lines you write the notes. So they are separate, the lines and the notes, and here. The lines themselves become the notes. Yeah, there is no distinction anymore between the lines on which you write and the notes and, and the notes themselves. Everything is kind of the form and the content. You can say that the lines, the stage is the form, and the notes are the content in traditional music. And here it's all mixed up. And yet you're right, Irene. There is also some rhythm and logic to it. Maybe even happening, but a different kind of harmony. Yeah? Maybe even 
Um, some of it looks like writing, as if someone just wrote words. Yeah? So it's notes. The, the whole familiar boundaries that keep things separate. Stave, notes, writing, music. What you hear and what you see. Everything gets mixed up. And then you get something out of it, which might not be what you normally expect to get. But yet, what I'm trying to suggest is that it's still making some kind of sense, even though it's not the kind of sense we're used to. So this is not complete chaos. There are still some rules here. Yeah? It's not complete. So it, it is still in some way within an institution. Um, I'm going back to the question you were asking earlier about, you know, to what extent it's possible to have any form of freedom. But if it's still within the institution of written music, but within this institution it attempts to subvert the logic, to subvert the rules, and to create something from these given blocks to create something different, something that redefines what music might mean. What do you think? Does it make sense? Okay. Good. Yes. In social terms, it would be um, anarchist. It could, yeah, it could be. Um, but then we need to make, perhaps we will need to talk, yeah, it, it would be anarchy. But anarchy, should be should not be understood as anything goes. Anarchy is also a system. It's also a method. So, for instance, for instance, anarcho-syndicalism, yeah, talks about let's say syndications, which is small communities. Um, so, yeah, it is probably closer to anarchy. Uh, but what I want to emphasizes that it is not the opposite of order, because there is order here. It's just a different notion of order. Yeah? Because, one second, because I don't want you to think that what the lesson of Atari propose is basically anything goes, no system, no rules, just do whatever you feel like. If you do whatever you feel like, will it be art? I'm asking. No. It's not enough, but it's, it's essential, yeah? But there has to be some order and some chaos. That what makes something happen, okay? Uh, what I see here is, uh, I guess, their diagram of schizophrenia. Mm. Good, I like that very much, yeah. Why do you say that? Uh, well, it's obviously the subject of which we're talking about, and also because <clears throat> like you were saying before, it's not specifically having no order, but just having a different order. And I guess their way of approaching uh, that clinically would be to sort of allow that uh, that uncontinuity and you know to sort of just covet it and you know instead of just putting them in a mental hospital. It's so I like that a lot. But that's very good. <laughs> Interesting, you know. That it's it's also very serious. It says. Uh, 14 piano piece for David Tudor IV. Yeah? So it even has a dedication, I think. It has many attributes of a musical manuscript. Um, it is. Yeah, it's, uh, it's attributed. So it is definitely not like this kind of thing that you can go to the wallpaper and, and, and just do, do that. You know, it's not a kind of. Well, fuck you, music. <laughs> <laughs> um, it is music. But it is music that wants to break from the restrictions imposed on how music should be done. Yeah? Because there are certain rules. That's how you do photography. That's how you bring up your children. That's how you make art. Yeah? And then, because there are rules, you can also mess with them. By messing with them, you might make something new, something different. Yeah? 
And somehow, this is a very memorable image. Once you see it, you're not going to forget that that is also possible. Wow. You know, who, who ever thought that it's possible to approach writing music like that? Sorry? Beethoven. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, maybe this is the only way to write music. Maybe every time some new original music happens, on some level, it is happening like that because it breaks away from the tradition, from the way things were done previously. Yeah. So perhaps it is an essential ability of the artist to, to understand the existing structure in order to be able to break away from it. But is this tension, you know, if you completely don't understand the structure, there's nothing to break away from. If you understand it too well and you become part of it, you cannot break away. So it is all the time being this kind of on the cusp. It's, it's, it's never really stable. It's just, now that could also become, one day, you can imagine a music academy where everyone is taught to do music just like that. That can also become orthodox. <coughs> yeah? Just because it appears violent and unruly to us doesn't mean that it can just become someone else's, okay, God, children, now everyone going to you know, do that exercise in their notebooks. Again, you will need to find a way to break away from it. Yeah? So the task of breaking away, the task of finding the new form of expression is a never-ending task. That's why, <coughs> as an artist, you never really know what the next artwork will look like. Because, as I was saying, okay, there is no formula. <coughs> okay, um, now, let's have a look at their first paragraph. Um, could someone, uh, who, who, who could read first? Anyone could read? Anyone feel like reading? Thank you, Ben. Would you start from the beginning? I just, I just read the first paragraph. Now, <coughs> I really want you to just open your ears to the voice of the Les Rotari speaking to you together in this strange voice of words. Please, Ben. The two of us rode into Oedipus together. Since each of us was, sev er, was several, there was already quite a crowd. Here we have made use of everything that came within range, what was closest as well as the furthest away. We have assigned clever pseudonyms to prevent recognition. Why have we kept our names? Out of habit, purely out of habit. To make ourselves unrecognizable in turn, to render imperc uh, imperceptible, not ourselves, but what makes us act, feel, and think. Also because it's nice to talk like everyone else, uh, to say the sun rises when everyone knows it's only a manner a manner of speaking to reach out not uh, Not the point where one no longer says I but the point where it is no longer of any importance whether one says I We are no longer ourselves Each will know each will know its own. We have been aided inspired multiplied Great. Thank you very much <coughs> How do you understand this paragraph? What do you get out of it? They're speaking with a common language. Yes. So, starting from the level playing field. A level playing field. Well, let's see. He said, they say, we wrote Antiedipus together. They talk about the previous book. They say, this is Thousand Protoes. We're all having to put together. As each one of us is already several personalities, that is already quite a big crowd. <laughs> um, and then and then they say, why have we kept our own names? Why have we kept our own names? Uh, why do you sign the artwork with your name? Well they say, well I, I love that, out of habit, purely out of habit. Um, the name doesn't matter. The name is not a representation of who you are. The name is not a signature. 
is not an identifier. You see how immediately they say, yes, we kept our own names. We could call, we could give the book a pseudonym or just leave the names out altogether. We kept the names, but don't attach too much significance to that. It's not because we are playing the identity game. It's just because this is a habit, you know? Um, but also the, the name, like, psychologically, can synthesize to us the reality, because uh, we, we are conscious to be subject with the name. That's right. But it's the consciousness of, of giving the name to ourselves. So if we lose it, it's coming back to this absolute and chaos. But they say, even though we kept our names, we already lost our names. Mm -hmm. and, and they also say, it's nice, and this is important, it's nice to talk like everybody else, to say the sun rises when everybody knows it is only a matter of speaking. Now, what it means to the practice of making art, because these are two artists talking about their work, they say, you don't need to go mad. You don't need to look like a crazy person in order to make art. It's nice to talk like everybody else. You know? Um, it's nice to behave normal. Why? Well, it gives you certain freedom. If you don't behave normal, then you might get locked up. You might get stigmatized. You know? So it's, it just gives you some form of freedom to talk like everybody else. Yeah? Otherwise, you might find yourself under house arrest, like every way. Uh, you, might, you might find yourself uh, thrown into prison. Being like everyone else and saying what is expected from you is a very important survival skill for an artist. Yeah? Um, also, yes? Uh, that means that, sorry, but that means that we should be part of the mass, even though when we think different? Yes, they, they say there is nothing wrong in behaving like everyone else. But even even when, and especially when, you make radical art. Yeah, but, but what happens if uh, you really think different and you don't couple or you, you can't be part of that mass because you are different, you are trying to force yourself to be part of something that you don't belong to? They say, Pretend that you belong. <laughs> Learn. Be fake. Be fake. Yeah. Learn to fake that you belong because it will help you to survive. It's a survival technique. They don't say you don't need to on the surface. Being like everyone else on the surface might help you to be very different and radical in what you do. And and because in a sense everyone has a limited amount of energy. If you spend a lot of energy on being different from everyone else, you might have no, no energy left for your writing, for your art, for your music. Yeah, but it's the same. If you spend too much energy trying to be part of something that you are not part of, you are spending a lot of energy. That's true. It is true as well. And I would not argue with that. They say that it was easier for them to keep their names. And also they say here, it is nice to talk, one second, it is nice to talk like everybody else, to say the sun rises when everybody knows it's only a matter of speaking. Because if every time someone said, oh, the sun, the sun is rising, they said, come on, you should know better. The sun doesn't rise, it's the air is going on around you. you know, haven't you read Copernicus? What is the matter with you people? You know, wake up, you know? You will waste a lot of energy, and in a sense, they kind of say, it's kind of pointless. Yeah? You have to, you have a project. You have art to make. You have your books to write. You have your poetry. You have to, you have your music. If you will be keeping fighting these things, you just might waste so much of your effort. Yeah? So it might, but they really talk about camouflage, about survival mechanism. But it's, uh, it also sounds that we are talking about a little bit of pleasure as well. You know, when they say it's nice to do that, it's not yeah. only by 
you know, of course, you not to be spending energy, with, wasting energy with something irrelevant, but also it's it's also good, you know, to be part it, in a certain way. It is it's nice, yeah, and you know, uh, Deleuze, uh, with all this talk of uh, us fucking all the philosophers, uh, was uh, uh, married to Fanny Deleuze, had children, had cats, uh, lived a very normal life of a respected university professor in a flat in Paris with the walls lined with good books. And in a sense, it is this normal environment that allows you to do extraordinary thinking. Yeah? Because if you say, oh, well, you know, I don't expect any of I'm going to live in a, on a, in a tree house, or I'm just going to be completely nomadic, you know, then you might not have enough power left to just sit down and write your books. He also said something that really stayed with me. Um, he said, many of my friends spend so much time in demonstrations that they never finished writing their pieces or their books. And in a sense, well, so, so, so it kind of emphasized it could be more revolutionary not to go to a demonstration, but to write your lecture, to write your seminar, to write your book. Well, it is a personal choice. And for someone else, for Guattari, for instance, he did spend a lot of time in demonstrations. He really was a political militant. So it's a choice. And I think you know, it, it might be that for someone, it is harder to fit in than not. But that's just how they describe their own strategy in making it possible to write a book. They said, well, it's, it's, it's sometimes, it's, in other words, they, they say, choose your battles carefully. Choose whether you want to fight against people saying the sun is rising every time it's said. You know? Because maybe there are more important struggles to be won. OK. Um, Now, let's go to, uh, but I just think, you know, they have, a, they have a particular voice when they, when they write together, which um, I really like. Let's go, uh, let's start, I want to give you a little bit of here, when they talk about what it's like to write a book. So, uh, Ben, could you continue uh, a little bit? We are on page four, and just, <coughs> just start from the last sentence on page four, and then I will uh, scroll up. Sorry, my page is on uh, page four, okay. Page four. Uh, writing has nothing to do with signifying Sorry, uh, same point. It has to do with surveying, mapping, even realms that are not yet to come. And carry on. The first type of book, sorry, give me a second. The first type of book is a root book. The tree is already an image of the world, or the root image of the world tree. This is the classical book as noble, signifying, and subjective organic interiority, the strata of the book. This, uh, the book, imitates the world as art imitates nature by producing specific to it that accomplish what nature cannot or can no longer do. The law of the book is the law of reflection, the one that becomes two. How could the law of the book reside in nature when it is, uh, when it is what proceeds over, over the very division between the world and book, nature and art? One becomes two, Whenever we encounter this formula, even stated strategically by Mayo, or understood in the most dialectical way possible, what we have before us is in the most classical and well-reflected, oldest and weirdest kind of thought. Stop here, please. OK. So they talk here. In the first chapter, they basically talk about the making of the book. Yeah. Where they say, where they talk about the making of the book, inside the book, yeah? So, as you see, here they discuss the making of the book. What is important to understand is that this is not an artist's statement. 
that is somehow attached or printed next to the artwork. It is the artwork. The statement about the making of the book makes the book. It's not outside of it. Yeah? Why is it important? This is something absolutely essential you have to understand about an artwork. An artwork has no explanation that is outside of the art. There is nothing to explain. What you have to say about your art is part of your art, and you have to make it so. They can talk, they can talk about the book throughout the book. Perhaps talking about the book is the book. Yeah? But it is what it is. It's not outside. Yeah? That's why, one second, Shimon. That's why you have to be very careful with any kind of explanation of what you've done. You always need to ask yourself, is the explanation of my artwork outside the artwork? Because if it is outside, something went wrong. Something is not complete. The explanation, if you need it, has to become the artwork. Yeah? So often in our critics, we discuss that, we often, often you heard us say, I mean, but, well, what you just said about your project is very interesting. But what a shame that it's not part of the project. Find a way of putting it into the work. Uh, yes. Is that showing the process? Good. Very good. Can you explain why? It just came to me as I was kind of hearing it, because that's what you're saying in the work about the process is really important. More than the spacing between them, that seems what it's been said. Spot on. Right on the money. The process is the artwork. In a sense, that's all there is. Because there is no goal. They could go over 600 pages, just talk about how they wrote the book. That would be the book. So yeah. a good artwork could uh, have not uh, a critic. Sorry? A real uh, a, an artwork that works in this way, with the surface, doesn't need a critic. The critic is slightly different, but the critic is not the artist. Um, you can write about an artwork, yeah, but I think the artwork doesn't need an explanation, or the, the explanation of the artwork is the artwork. Yeah, so it's not, it's not so much about the critic, it's a different question. What is important is that they talk here about two types of books. A first type of book is the root book. And, and I challenge you now, or I'm asking you, to think back about the first half of today's session. What are we talking about? The first type of the book is the root book. Root book? Does it ring a bell? What kind of book it is? Huh? What is no. Uh, Very good. Analog. Analog. What is the. What does it mean, a root book? It's a stage philosophy. No, a stage philosophy. Who said that? <laughs> good, good. God, you are on fire today. That's very good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the root book. Why, why root book is stage philosophy? You plant the seed in the ground. The tree grows up. There is all this analogical connection. Yeah, the, the blossom of the apple tree justifies planting the little seed in the ground. Yeah, all this connection. The tree is already the image of the world, of the root, the image of the, or the root, the image of the world tree. This is the classical book, noble, signifying subjective organic interiority, continuity, harmony, sensible, yeah? All these things. The book imitates the world. In other words, the book represents the world as art imitates nature. Vermeer, the painting of the city of death, correct? Uh, by procedures specific to it that accomplish what nature cannot or can no, no longer do. The law of the book <coughs> is the law of reflection, the one that becomes two. Yeah? This is how a presentation operates. And they say that's not only how paintings are made, it is also how books are written. Now, <coughs> the
they had the little stuff here at Komsky that we already uh, met. Uh, but we're going to uh, And now we move to the second type of a book. So basically they say, there are two ways you can do a book. Or in other words, there are two ways you can make an artwork. You can either do an artwork that will resemble a tree. Yeah? In what sense Vermeer's painting resembles a tree? Can anyone tell me? Because I see. Yes. The smallest, the significance, so everything is referred to an element and a logical. Correct, Maria, that's absolutely right. This is the model of this painting, according to Deleuze and Guattari's logic, is the tree, because it is analogical to some reality, to some origin. Yeah? So this is the, the tree model of art. Even if it is not a picture of a tree, there is a tree there. Yeah? So, good. Well, I think we're really getting it. <laughs> Slowly, we are getting it. Uh, and now, here is the new, here is the other approach. Um, who could read the second, the second <coughs> approach? Okay, please. The radical system of classical root is the second figure of the book, to which a monarchy pays winning regions. This time, the principal root has aborted, or its pit has been destroyed. An immediate, indefinite multiplicity of secondary roots grafts onto it and undergoes a flourishing development. This time, natural reality is what aborts the principal root, but the root's unity subsists as fast or yet to come as possible. We must ask if reflexive spiritual reality is what? What? <laughs> we must ask if reflexive spiritual reality does not compensate for this state of things by demanding an even more comprehensive secret unity or more extensive totality. Take William Barrow's cut of method, the folding of one text onto another, which constitutes multiple and even adventitious roots like a cutting implies a supplementary dimension to that of the text under consideration. In the supplementary dimension of folding, unity continues its spiritual labor. That is why the most resolutely fragmented work can also be presented as the total work of magnum opus. Okay, that's good. Uh, so can you tell me what, what is the second model of the book? The first takes the tree as its model. The second, they say, modernity pays to it a willing alliance. That is not yet how they wrote their book. The second model, it is William Burroughs' cut-up method. Who was, who is William, William Burroughs? What did he write? Naked Lunch, did you see the film? David Cronenberg? Yeah. yeah? But put it on your list of films uh, to watch. Um, Naked Lunch. Um, <coughs> the film is uh, great, but the book is very interesting. What is William Burroughs' cut-up method? How he used to write? Well, this is how he used to write. First, um, he used to get very high. <laughs> no, seriously. Um, there was a particular kind of a cough inhaler you could get. And you can, I think you can still get it. And you used to take, <laughs> it's basically like, 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 like a some kind of cotton thing uh, soaked in some liquid inside a plastic tube that you inhale. You used to take this cotton thing and distill it or chew it or something like that. Basically extract all this active ingredient. Yeah. Um, and that worked basically like, like some kind of amphetamine. So you used to get very high. Then you used to take all these pages of type written text and cut it into strips and reassemble it. Yeah? So all the pages 
pages cut into strips and reassemble. And that became the book. Does it work? Well, it kind of depends, yeah? That's how you that's how you write your essays. I, th I think it actually works, and I think very often when you get stuck in your writing, just taking a paragraph from somewhere else and sticking it in and continuing with that can really help to move the thing to, to move the thing along. Um, there is something very liberating, um, or I often find that just opening one of the books on my desk at random, looking at some paragraph, and writing in response to that helps to just get to the next stage. So that, it's kind of, it's not a system, but it's a method. It's a way you, you can keep making things just by allowing some element of accident into your work. Um, I want to move to the next, uh, so bear with me a second. Uh, Okay. And here we have Let's start from here. Vishal, could you read uh, from this? The multiple? Yes. The multiple must be made, not by always adding a higher dimension but rather in the simplest of ways, by dint of sobriety, with the number of dimensions one already has available, always n minus one. Correct. The, the only way the one belongs to the multiple, always subtracting. Okay, let's stop here. And uh, Dario, do you think you could tell us what is n minus one? How do you understand that? Well, uh, I think before the reading of minus is wrong which kind of supposes that uh, one was part of this n, but you could, uh, instead of saying n minus one, say n without one. Uh, that, so that there is never this identity uh, belonging to the n. So you can always only see the one as, uh, the n as multiple. Good, did you get it? Did you understand it? Because, yeah. 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 When you say minus one, you're, really presupposing that there's, there was one that was the first. There was something that, uh, there was some kind of origin in this whole, um, in the system. But when we uh, decide not to have one, so it's without one, means there is no one single origin. This is also where we come to Rhizome, because Rhizome has many rules. So which was the first root that where the plant <coughs> or the uh, ginger uh, started growing? So what is the N? The N. Is the N identity? No, it's a non-identity. Non-identity. What is it? would if if we do say the N without one, that was, we are already saying that it, it exists in relation to one, right? Even it's if we say N minus one, that means you're taking something out of N. But if you say n without one, that you say you're saying n exists, but n exists only in relation to no. not one, not having one. It exists, but it cannot exist absolutely. Well, maybe it's more about uh, again, uh, what kind of weight do we give to that one? Because um, when you have one and you're relating the whole thing to the one, you're giving a lot of weight to it. It's like giving the weight to the root of the whole, where did it come from? This kind of reminds me of uh, Eliteos, like it's rather than, rather than uh, revealing something, or you know, rather, what was it? Um, and being correct? Yeah, well, just, just a different way of looking at uh, taking something away, you know? Very good, yeah. You said Alicia, yeah. the Heideggerian notion of truth as revealing. Yeah. Brilliant. Uh, can you uh, read the one I have it here in red? <laughs> a system of this kind could be called a rhizom. A rhizom, a subterranean stem, is absolutely different from roots and radicals. 
bulbs and tubers are rhizomes. Yes, one more sentence. Plants with roots or radicals may be rhizomorphic in other respects altogether. The question is whether plant life in its specificity is not entirely rhizomorphic. Stop here for a second. Ah, oh, actually, one more sentence. Even some animals are in their pack form. Rats are rhizomes. Group. Yeah. What is a rhizome? I mean, this is really important, and we're going to discuss that uh, for the next few minutes. So the first model of a book, or an artwork, is a tree. As we saw, Vermeer's painting is essentially a tree. Yeah? Good. 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 Did you ever think that that's what <laughs> you will be discussing <laughs> on your MA course, you know? Uh, but then there is this other model, which is a rhizome. What is a rhizome? Now, I encountered the rhizome very recently because uh, I learned about something that's called the Japanese knotweed. Do you know about it? Yeah. What is it? It's a plant that just destroys the rhizome. It's a plant that in, the Victorians brought in from Japan to strengthen the banks of the railways. Somehow, I don't know why they thought it was going to work. Of course, it doesn't work. Not only does it strengthen the bank of the railways, it basically destroys everything. Um, it's, it's, it's like a bamboo. It grows about 40 centimeters in 24 hours. It's very uh, fast growing. It grows through concrete. It grows through brick. It grows through the floor. It's unstoppable. It's like a weed. It's a weed, yeah. It, it's a weed, but it looks like a bamboo. You can eat it, by the way, but, uh, but uh, it, because it, it, um, it's very difficult to exterminate because, because it's a rhizome. Even if you have a tiny bit left somewhere in the ground, it will grow. It doesn't need a root. It can just grow any part of, the, of this thing, can sprout into another one of this, of this weed, weed thing. Yeah? So, I'm saying that the rhizome doesn't need to be beautiful, it doesn't need to be lovely. Um, I know some people who are anti delusion simply because they cannot get this weed out of their garden. Uh, it, is, um, it is a curse, right? But what you need to understand, what they're talking about, they take, they take this notion of what, what is the rhizome? Do you know mushrooms? Yeah? So how mushrooms grow? They don't grow from one single root. Yeah? They sprout yeah, in different parts. So here we have another model to take and think about art with. Not as an analogon, not as a, 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 when the image is analogical to some reality, but as this rhizome that just sort of sprouts here and there. Um, what else? What else is like a rhizome? Well, they say rats are rhizome. And what they mean, so what does it mean to say that rats are rhizomes? It means that there is never, you never encounter a single rat. Rats live in, <laughs> uh, rats live in, um, what they are called, ducks. Yeah? And in a sense, <coughs> the pack is the, a swarm. Yeah? Swarm, have you ever seen, let's say, a swarm of swallows flying? Yeah? Yeah? Some birds move as this entity, of, as a swarm entity. And it has good reasons. It's, it's much easier to avoid predators, for instance, when you fly in this configuration. Um, military um, attack jets also fly in this kind of swarm configuration. It's, it's logical, it's rational. At the same time, it means that it's not about the individual. The individual is only part, is only an organ within this configuration. So fish move in schools, school of fish. Yeah? So some animals, they say, only operate as a pack. The pack, in a sense, is the animal. Yeah? But yeah, there's some way, I think it's a huge one. So they all the, the whole pack. That's right, that's right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There are many examples of it. Um, it could be that this rhizomatic thinking allows us to approach reality in, in a different way. So
So, we, so instead of thinking about individuals, not only rats, but also humans, we can think about a horizon, about a pack, about a swarm, yeah? And how the swarm really has a dynamic mentality and a, a life of its own, yeah? So it's just shifting the focus slightly. What does it mean to talk about an artwork as a horizon? It means not to be obsessed too much with the origin, with the connection with reality, with the analogon, but more allow the artwork <coughs> to kind of sprout and send some shots and bulbs and flowers in various directions without any premeditated connection to the origin. In other words, digital. Not analogical, but digital. This is Horizon. Here is another example of Horizon, the network. Yeah? All our computers here are somehow connected to the network, but are they like branches connected to a tree? Well, no, because where is the tree? There is no central telephone system, uh, telephone exchange. You know? In a sense, you could say the telephone operates as a tree, because in the past, in some Hitchcock films, you would even see the telephonist saying, you know, you, you dial the number, you go to the telephone exchange, and you say where you want to connect, and they plug you in. So it's all kind of, there is this tree trunk that connects every branch with any other. The network has a different principle. There is no central branch. There is just, there are just nodal points. And packets of data never pass through any central organizer mechanism, even though what it is so not is questionable these days. Um, but you might say there is a central organizer mechanism, and maybe Google actually wants the network to be more like a tree and less like a horizon. Yeah? And that would be an interesting thing to discuss, but and we will get into that. But the network, the, the internet or the web, compared to the telephone network, shows you these two models. The telephone, the analogical model, the tree model, the network, the rhizomatic model, the sort of swarm. Yeah? Do you know what was how the internet was invented when it was still called the Arcanet? It was another one of these great uh, Cold War inventions, and maybe I'm telling you something that you already know, but, <laughs> but um, during the Cold War, um, one of the concerns the American military had was that what if the Russians will, let's say, bomb Pentagon and all our information will just get destroyed. So they wanted to develop a model to survive an attack on their central control mechanism. And what they developed is a way, a way to disseminate the information between different places, all connected to each other, but without a single centralized place. Yeah? So then, even if, and at first, the connection was between different computing departments in some universities, Berkeley, Chicago, uh, MIT, so even if one of the centers gets bombed, <coughs> all the others can keep functioning because there is no one central point you could attack and destroy everything. Yeah? That was the thinking behind developing the internet. The inter interconnected net. The internet. Yeah? So that's that's the reason. That's why, by the way we look at the Les Inquatari, because if you want to work analogically, if you want to work like Vermeer, and I don't say there's nothing wrong with that, you don't need the Les Inquatari. But if you want to work digitally, if you want to work with networks, then you need them. Then you need to understand what is a network, why is it not a tree, and what it allows you to do, how, how it allows you to operate. Um, any questions so far?
1 and 2. Uh, who could read? Could someone else read to us? Okay. <coughs> 1 and 2. Principles of connection and heterogeneity. Any point of a rhizome can be connected to anything other and must be. This is very different from the tree or root, which plots a point, fixes an order. Okay, principles of... So now we talk about some principles of making a rhizomatic artwork. <coughs> now this is simply to take home with you and practice. This is simply how you make rhizomatic art. How, what do you do First, principles of connection and he heterogeneity. What is heterogeneity? What is hetero? Hetero. Other. What is genus? Origin. Yeah? <coughs> Different other origins. Yeah? It basically means you can take any point can be connected to any other and must be. It means how do you know what is the next step in your art? Any point can be connected to any point. You can, you don't need to follow the rational logic of beginning, middle and end, of the, ori the, the seed and the tree, the original and the image, the model and the copy. Uh, you don't need, for instance, Siobhan, um, you don't need to work with the mannequin. <laughs> Because the mannequin is still analogical. Yeah? It's still an analogous of a certain... But not as a robot. A robot is more interesting. Because the robot can have different parts. It has one, one hand might, might come from a vacuum cleaner. And the head might come from a toilet seat. Yeah? It's less homogeneous. It, it, it's less homogeneous. Yeah? So, so, just a, so think, for instance, about what do, what a, how will heterogeneity express itself or find itself uh, articulated in a mannequin? What a rhizomatic mannequin would look like? It might not look like a replica of a physical body. It might be something else. Yeah? Um, this is very different, they say, from the tree or root, which plots a point, fixes an order. It basically means, in your art, make connections. Realize that the rule is that any point can be and should be connected to any point. Yeah? If, let's say, this class was arranged on the tree model, then you would be sitting quietly and I would be the root of the tree, you know, and you would be the branches. But this is not the model this class operates. We learn from each other, and the conversation you have between you and across you is, we can all the time connect any point to any point. That is the idea of having the seminar organized in this way. And now you know, by the way, why that's how the table is always organized. And I refuse, I'm, I'm now giving lectures in the photographer's gallery, and they wanted to put the tables like this in the classroom, and I refused to, to teach in that way. I said, I'm not going to stand in front of rows of students. It has to be organized like this. They were like, they had a heart attack. You know, they <laughs> <laughs> but I think this is the only way you can work. And as you see, it kind of works. You know, it kind of works for whatever reason. That is the rising. So this class, in a sense, is a rising. Yeah? Is it complete chaos? Well, no, it's not complete chaos. But it allows some chaos. We never know exactly what's going to happen. We never know exactly what will be the next interjection, the next provocation, the next comment or objection. You know? And this structure creates an environment where that can happen. Yeah, this is, so, so rhizome 
also does not mean that there is no logic or no order. It's a little bit like that drawing here. Yeah? Um, it is order, but not as you know. It is logic, but another. It is something, but not quite a cognizant. Where, where it goes from here, you don't really know. You cannot predict it because it's not part of any scale. Yeah, maybe the next node will take you somewhere else. But, and yet, it's, not, it's also not meaningless. Yeah, just like here, we can discuss a lot of things, and yet it's not some kind of free association. Not anything goes. But what goes, we don't quite know. Yeah? Does it make sense? That is really what the Les and are talking about when they speak about working or writing rhizomatically. Um, now, one more thing, and then I will uh, let you go. Uh, another principle. Third principle. Who could give us the third principle? Who could read it? Read it. Principle of multiplicity. It is only when the multiple is effectively treated as a substantive multiplicity that it ceases to have any relation to the one as subject or object, natural or spiritual, reality, image, and world. Multiplicities are rhizomatic and expose arborescent pseudo-multiplicities for what they are. There is no unity to serve as a pivot in the object or divide, to divide in the subject. Let's stop here for a second. So first, what is arborescent? Like a tree. Tree bore. Yeah, arbor is tree. Arborescent is again this tree that they hate. Somewhere in the book they say, we are so tired of trees. You know, we have enough of trees. Um, and you can see why. So, so here are the principles of making a rhizomatic or a digital artwork. Principle one and two, connection and heterogeneity. Yeah. So you connect any point with any point. You don't need to have a unified origin. It means you can bring whatever you want. I mean, you can bring whatever into your artwork. The question is, does it work? If it works, leave it there. It might come from an unexpected place, but if it makes sense, if it works, leave it there. You know, just because you started, let's say, working with oil paint, it doesn't mean that you cannot bring in wire or plastic or some dirt or, I don't know, some feces. You know, you can if you want. Have you seen the installations that Alex creates in the street? Yeah? They are. Everything can be connected to everything. They are heterogeneous by design. Yeah? So these are the principles of, uh, of Ryzen. The third principle that Ben just read now is the principle of multiplicity. What, what it means? It means that there is no one origin, there are multiple points of entry. There is no origin, there is no model that you later copy in your work. Or maybe there are many models, and you copy all of them. Uh, multiplicities are rhizomatic and expose arborescent pseudo multiplicities. Pseudo multiplicities for what they are. What is a pseudo multiplicity? Something that behaves, something that behaves like a rising, but is not a rising. For instance, a dining cube. Yeah? A banyan tree. Banyan tree. What is that? Oh, I didn't realize. <laughs> uh, a banyan tree is a palm tree. I don't know if it's present in Europe, but it is in Asia. It's a tree which has multiple trunks. Okay, okay. But, but maybe, maybe for instance, cubism is an example of pseudo multiplicity. There is some multiplicity, but it's very neatly orga organized within the framed canvas. Yeah? What would maybe a real multiplicity would be to take 
every aspect, every dimension of the cubist painting and put it separately. Yeah? Does it make sense? As a kind of visual example of what it might look like? Yeah, it basically says, don't try to put everything within a frame. Don't try to organize everything neatly so it will somehow make sense. Allow for the multiplicity to roam freely. See what happens. Um, do we have another dimension? I like that. Another principle. There are a few more which you can find later when you read it. Principle of as signifying rupture. The over signifying breaks separating structures of cutting across a single structure. A rhizome may be broken, shattered at a given spot, but it will still start up again on one of its old lines or on new lines, like the musical notation we saw earlier. You can never get rid of ants because they form an animal rhizome that can rebound time and again after most of it has been destroyed. Yeah, so that's the ants. Why ants are a rhizome? Do you understand? Because it's spawn. Because killing a single ant will not, or killing even most ants, or even all of them, will not get rid of the ants. Yeah? That is the power of the rhizome. Yeah? The principle of as signifying rupture. Don't make, don't signify, don't obsess too much with your work signifying anything outside. You know? Basically it says don't don't put too much weight on representing. Yeah? Allow things just to be for themselves. Allow them to express their powers of multiplicity. Okay, guys, I think it's enough. You did really well today. Yeah. To share something. Yes. Uh, the other day, I was uh, walking in the street here, and there were these two women talking about their dental work. But, um, <laughs> it was something stuck out that they said, and this is in, in relation to the whole seminar. They said, to sort it out, we need to kill that root. Uh huh. <laughs> <laughs> Very good. That's a nice point on which to finish. Thank you very much, guys. You were great today.